Anyways, uh, where was I? I'm sorry. I got lost there. Um, this is from Katie Halper. If anybody knows who Katie Halper is, she's pretty, pretty cool. Um, this is an epic brain-wormed mic resistance response to Greta, Greta Thunberg. It has everything. Xenophobia, McCarthyism, enabling Democrats' literal destruction of the planet. So Greta tweeted, the Democratic National Committee this week quietly dropped language calling for an end to fossil fuel subsidies and tax breaks from its party platform. I just covered this the other day. So not even the very, very minimum. In other words, what she's trying to say is that the Democrats are lying to you when they tell you that they care about climate change. But Trump, bad. And somebody tweeted, old enough to remember when foreigners influencing U.S. elections was frowned upon. Oh. Ooh. Um, yeah, remember when a foreign country... Um, remember when a foreign country tilted our election towards Trump and the Democrats didn't do anything about it? You know, they kept giving him... Uh, a military budget. They kept signing, you know, they signed his wall funding. They signed, you know, they kept uh, approving his judges. Remember that? Remember how they resisted Trump so much? Um, yeah. Anyways, but correct, correct for Greta Thunberg to call that out. To call out the Democrats for being the lying, corrupt pieces of crap that they are. Um, this is an interesting article uh, found on Twitter. And this actually is interesting because I live in Los Angeles, but it's titled, What's the Best Way to Evacuate Los Angeles? Uh, when a wildfire earthquake strikes, cars can't be the only option. I, well, I don't know. What, uh, what are the other options for getting out of LA? You're going to walk? You're going to bike? I mean, you know, I would probably say biking is your, your best bet. I don't know, motorcycle? When a wind-whipped inferno 14 miles wide crested the hills of Malibu for thousands of residents, Pacific Coast Highway was the only way out. But the Woolsey Fire raced closer to the ocean on November 9, turning canyon roads into ribbons of flames. The highway became snarled by the volume of cars fleeing South to Santa Monica. The Malibu Times reported that it took some drivers up to seven hours to travel 20 miles to safety. A trip that would normally take about an hour. But, th you know, this happens all the, you know, this happens when there's a hurricane and people are evacuating Florida or Texas. This happens in any emergency. So I don't, you know, um, that's why they have hurricane lanes in places where hurricanes are frequent. Um, Everybody in that 14-mile range was being evacuated, and there was a very small funnel for thousands of residents and people to get out. Um, would you prefer a helicopter? Boats? I don't know. California Highway Patrol Lieutenant Kevin Kirker told the Malibu City Council earlier this month, even with delays, the evacu evacuation worked for the most part. Three people were killed, but 250,000 residents ordered to evacuate got out alive. Can you say climate refugees? Because a lot of those people are, haven't gone back. Um, L.A. might not fare as well in the next fire. In September, drivers flee, fleeing the Delta fire backed up traffic along the 5 north of Redding. As the fire burned close to the interstate, one couple escaped by driving through a gap in the center divider. But the fire moved so quickly that dozens of people deserted their cars and ran for their lives. Two months later, the campfire, which would become the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in history, overwhelmed the city of Paradise. As a community of more than 25,000 tried to outmaneuver the fast-moving firestorm, evacuees became trapped in their cars. Of the fire's 86 victims, eight died in vehicles while try trying to drive to safety, five in a single cul-de-sac. As more and more residents are permitted to move into fire-prone areas and as fires become more frequent, more destructive, and more unpredictable, experts say Los Angeles must reconsider how to evacuate without relying so heavily on cars. I, I, Okay, okie dokie, <laughs> evacuations in some ways point out the major flaws in the system that we have on a day-to-day -day basis, says John Wren, who studies disaster planning 
at the Center for Urban and Environmental Solutions at Florida Atlantic University. The auto dependency we built becomes even more problematic. Uh, you know, we are a city of, I don't even know what the number is now. Some say six, eight, 12 million, depends on the area that you call LA. There's a lot of people here. Uh, I, can t I can guarantee you cars are not, it, evacuating a lot, that many people in a disaster is just a disaster, period. So I don't know how you really plan for that. I don't know what you do, but let's read on. Um, from 2000 to 2015, the number of cars in Southern California has increased at four times the rate it did in the 1990s. Joy. In that time, the region added 2.3 million people and 2.1 million household vehicles, according to a UCLA study. Residents aren't just buying more cars. As Los, An Los Angeles expands, people are living closer to areas prone to fire. More than half of the new home built homes built over the last four decades are located in car-dependent, high-fire-risk zones known as wild wildland urban interface. Oh, isn't that nice? We're interfacing with wildlife. Um, this week, Los Angeles County's Board of Supervisors approved adding 19,000 new homes on wildland urban lands. That just means they're building in the foothills. That means they're just building higher into the foothills, you know, further out into the desert or where, you know, whatever. Um, at the same time, climate change is exacerbating the severity of disasters, says Lucy Jones, a seismologist formerly with the U.S. Geological Survey who now works with cities to address disaster risk. With these new explosive fires, and I say new because due to extreme heat, they grow radically fast, that creates a different evacuation issue than we have had for other fires, she says. The solution isn't widening roads through LA's disaster prone areas, experts say. Nobody is going to say build a 47 lane freeway straight to the middle of the suburbs of Los Angeles. Right. Um, says Brian Walshen, a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Louisiana State University. We're not going to build a road just for evacuation. What we can do, though, is get emergency agencies to better manage what we have. As witnessed during the Woolsey fire, even roadways like PCH that are built for high volumes of cars can become gridlocked when many evacuees use them at once. In his role designing evacuation plans for cities, Walshin has confronted with, was confronted with a scenario similar to what Malibu officials faced on PCH, allowing all 25,000 residents of the Florida Keys to leave within a 24-hour period on a single highway. The state wasn't going to widen US-1 which hops 100 miles from island to island through sensitive marine environments, the small cities along the Keys didn't want more lanes of traffic built for their communities anyways. Um, Walshin's team proposed solutions that rerouted traffic on existing streets, managing the flow of cars and reducing conflicts that might cause crashes. The plan was successful for the evacuation before Hurricane Irma in 2017. Um... Uh, yeah, okay, so as traffic backed up on PCH on November 9, city and county agencies worked together to implement a similar solution in Malibu using what engineers called ContraFlow. The two northbound lanes of PCH were converted into southbound lanes all the way to Santa Monica. More cars could travel south. And that's what they do. Um, that's what they do in, like, Texas and Florida. If there's a hurricane and people are all moving in one direction, they just open both lanes of the freeway going in one direction. So it's, you know, fairly intuitive and simple but um but i would have to say um a there's a problem with people living in sensitive areas like look you 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 live there at your own risk you live in malibu at your own risk you live on you know in the foothills or on the on a mountainside at your own risk you know what the risk is so you need to be prepared for it obviously you know it's good for cities or agencies fire agencies to declare uh, you know, disaster areas or tell people to evacuate sooner rather than later. But not, people don't always heed these uh, notices or um, evacuation orders, right? Um, however, if you live in a major city, right, that might be impacted by climate change or by wildfires or by hurricanes or by floods or whatever, you have to know that you're in a harsh situation living in a large city. You just have to accept that as part of the package. Um, you're going to have to spot problems earlier than other people and evacuate yourself 
if you want to be safe and not caught in a crowd of people rushing out of the city, or just move out of the city way before something happens, right? And I'm talking to people of, you know, the pe- again, the people of Miami, the people of New Orleans, the, you know, people who are living in flood, uh, storm surge prone areas. If you live there, you're taking on a certain amount of risk by living there. And if you, if you understand that climate change is getting worse and that people are, are, are going to be prone to these disasters uh, much more frequently, then you're going to have to just consider the idea of moving out. Of leaving, right? If you live in a large area and it's or a fire-prone area, consider that where you live comes with risk, and consider leaving either sooner than later, or consider moving out sooner than later. I don't know. You know, it's up everywhere in, is everywhere in the era of climate change is dangerous. There's really no safe place. So you're gonna have to just. Educate yourself and be aware of the problem. Adapt your lifestyle to the idea that you're going to have to move quickly in any situation, whether it's hurricane, flood, wildfire, drought. You're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to live your life with the idea that you're going to have to leave your residence quickly, have a go bag or have some evacuation plan or have somewhere to go, have some kind of, you know, idea about how you're going to escape, right, earlier than later. That's just... That's just life in the present moment. Um, exactly. Rich Diana, I've been running from overshoot my entire adult life. No escape now. Ask the animals. I grew up in the mountains of Colorado. We were taught that fire is something one, one must accept by living there. It, exactly. And you're not going to you know, build your way, infrastructure your way out of it. It's just not something that you're going to be able to build for. You're, you're going to have to educate people that this climate change is a real thing. Um, that wildfires are going to happen every single year, worse and worse and worse, all year round. It's, they're not going away. It's not going to get better. It's not going to... You are, every single year, <clears throat> you live in a wildfire-prone <clears throat> area. <clears throat> every single year, the chances that you are going to be affected by a wildfire are going to go up in the era of climate change. <clears throat> and that's just something that people are going to have to either educate themselves on or hopefully, you know... Scientists or the news or agencies are going to educate you on that as well. But, you know, the chances of that are kind of slim to none. <clears throat> Kuro hikes, no one's coming to help you. You better be able to help yourself. Natural disaster. Hashtag. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Canadian prepper is good. Definitely. <clears throat> Jay Brandt says, come to Cleveland, Ohio. It's viable and still cheap. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of people think that's a good place to move to avoid climate disaster somewhere in the Great Lakes area, Midwest, upper, upper Midwest. Lots of water, lots of rivers, lots of lakes, lots of natural water supply. I don't know about the temperatures, though, but, you know. Uh, let's move on. Where are we? <clears throat> so, getting into hurricane news, prepare for battle, tweets Michael Mann. Uh, this is about the dual hurricanes coming towards the Gulf of Mexico. I've never seen two hurricanes. This is from Eric Blake. He re- retweets Eric Blake. I've never seen two hurricanes forecast to cross paths 36 hours apart in the Gulf of Mexico. Marco and Laura are serious concerns for the next several days. U.S. US watches possibly uh, possible later today for two different areas. Incredible and not good. Uh, Moving on from live science. First ever, ever double hurricane could hit the Gulf of Mexico. There have never been two hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico at the same time before. And uh, next week, for the first time on record, two hurricanes could hit the Gulf of Mexico at the same time, twice before. In 1959 and 1933, two tropical storms have entered the Gulf at the same time. 
but never before have both been hurricanes. It might not go that way. Only one of the storm systems has yet strengthened into a tropical storm, a dangerous cyclone, but not yet a hurricane. The other remains a tropical depression, and its future is still unclear. But forecast models have suggested the possibility since at least Thursday, and the storms are still following the path that could lead to double Gulf hurricanes. The National Hurricane Center, NHC, has issued tropical storm warnings across much of the Caribbean for Tropical Storm Laura, which reached tropical storm strength today, meaning it has wind speeds between 39 and 73 miles per hour. It's currently east of Puerto Rico, and early forecast tracks show it whirling over the, that U.S. territory, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Florida, and then into the Gulf over the course of the weekend and early next week. <clears throat> A tropical depression 14 expected to take the name Marco if it becomes a tropical storm is moving more slowly. Forecast tracks show it heading north from its current location near Honduras. Straight up the Gulf, the NHC has issued tropical storm warnings for parts of Honduras and southeastern Mexico and a hurricane watch for much of eastern Mexico. Um... Early forecast maps of interacting winds from the two storms show them overlapping in the Gulf. Meteorologists have said it's still too early to predict exactly how the two storms will behave, particularly if they begin to interact strongly. Uh, one possibility is a significant Fujiwara effect. According to the NHC, that's a term meteorologists use for when two tropical cyclones near each other and, uh, near each other and start to dance around their common center. Uh, apparently, this happened in 2017. Uh, hurricanes Irwin and Hillary circling each other and merging in the Pacific Ocean due to the Fujiwara effect. It's still unclear at this point how that would impact the movements of the storms in the Gulf, though the Washington Post report reports that one possibility is a delayed arrival for Marco, giving it more time to strengthen over warm water. The 2020 hurricane season has been extraordinarily busy, with Laura already a record setter today. August 21 is the earliest L storm ever named. Tropical cyclones are named in alphabetical order as they achieve tropical storm strength. There you go. Uh, hold on one second. All right. Pardon the interruption. Um, this from David Wallace Wells. California has Australian problems now. California is Australia now. Beginning late last year, it was in what is already known as the country's Black Summer. Bushfires burned through 46 million acres or 72,000 square miles, killed several billion animals, pushing a number of species to extinction or the brink of it. Flooding Sydney with air so thick with smoke, ferries couldn't navigate its harbor and fire alarms and office buildings rang out. Registering the smoke as a proof, as proof the building itself was in flame. Enforcing beachfront evacuations and scenes that crossed Dunkirk with Mad Max. The situation today in California isn't yet quite as grim, although this week Cal Fire advised every citizen of the state, all 40 million of them, to be prepared to evacuate. Every citizen of the state. Already more than 100,000 already have. Over just the last seven days, 700,000 acres have burned in California, a number that would have been in recent memory a historically devastating year of fire in just five days. More land has burned than in all of 2019, and 500,000 of those acres are in and around the Bay Area. There, the lightning complex in wildfire terminology complexes when multiple blazes join forces has alone burned 200,000 acres in, and is at present 0% contained. The complex could burn as many as a million acres. It's been suggested the state's first gigafire. The lightning storms that set it off simultaneously ignited so many other wildfires the state authorities couldn't keep track of all of them just 
the 376 most significant ones. All told, more than 10,000 lightning strikes were recorded in a single day. Remember that lightning gets more fre frequent uh, and severe with climate change, right? More water vapor in the air, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All told, more than uh, 10,000 lightning strikes were recorded in a single day. The week saw 560 wildfires start. Big Basin Redwood State Park has been burned through, prompting a conservation group to write, we are devastated to report that Big Basin as we have known it, loved it, and cherished it for generations is gone. These trees are between 800 and 1,500 years old. Some of them older than Muhammad had stood for 1,000 years by the time Europeans first set foot in North America. The youngest of them are older than the Black Death and precede the invention of the printing press by centuries. Reports yesterday had them scorched but still standing. One of the trees near the Big Basin Redwood State Headquarters burns from within. I'm going to play this a little bit. California has been on fire before. Indeed, in the distant past, it burned this expansively quite regularly. What is most... Remarkable about the fires of 2020 is that these complexes are burning without the aid of a dramatic wind, which is typically even more than the tinder of dry scrub and forest, what really fuels California fire. Historically, this kind of burning is unimaginable in the absence of the Santa Ana winds, which is to say, believe it or not, things could be much, much worse. Indeed, the wind is actually calm, by and large, throughout the state, keeping the burning relatively contained but allowing the smoke to settle locally. Uh, even so, the smoke covers nearly the entire western United States, choking 11 states and two Canadian provinces. And while two active growing fires are already among the 10 biggest ever to hit the state, we are only at just the very beginning of the fall fire season. None of the initial reports in the New York Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, NPR, or the San Jose Mercury News even so much as mentioned climate change. Of course they didn't. Though, of course, especially in the absence of wind, the conditions of the state's landscape help explain the outbreak. The frequency of extreme fires has doubled since just the 1980s and is poised to grow even more in the decades ahead. And the signs of warming are unmistakable, even looking past the fires, which any Californian would tell you you simply cannot. This past week in Death Valley, a global temperature record was set at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. The next day, the forecast predicted 132. This is the temperature of steak cooked medium rare. Fires are among the best and most horrifying propagandists for climate change, terrifying and immediate no matter how far from a fire zone you live. They offer up vivid, scarring images it can be impossible not to read as port portents of future nightmares even as they document present tragedies and horrors. In recent years, they have been a terrifying th through line. 2017's golfing through the apocalypse. 2018's campfire evacuation videos. The image of a kangaroo backlit by roiling orange like a fire diorama. This year's fires in California have already produced such a photo by Noah Berger, which reminds us that no wildlife, indeed no climate impact of any kind, unfolds in a vacuum, instead cascading upon communities often numb to catastrophe, even as they are made more and more vulnerable with each successive one. Notably, there are no people depicted, only a welcome sign, mordantly mod modified to offer pandemic guidance, in the hope that co coordinated human response might protect us from that threat. It is less like a depiction of unfolding terror than a real-time relic from a world already lost. Hope you enjoyed that. Reading from David Wallace Wells. Hey guys, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and you can support the channel with the links below uh, PayPal, Patreon, Square. Uh, also, if you'd like to watch the live streams, you can watch the live streams on my Patreon channel. You can subscribe for as little as a dollar. Um, so, hopefully, I will see you over there, and thanks so much.